they have some pretty progressive farmers. Mm -hmm. um, so you'd be able to capture the full range from you know a single split application of corn to variable rate. I mean, the, the equipment that they're using is phenomenal. Um, and so they are one of them, but I think that putting everything on the shoulders of 10 districts um, and staffing wise, implementation wise, that if you could get some of the others, particularly heavy agronomic, um, that it would certainly help um, tremendously. Because they shouldn't be, dis the other districts should not be discounted because they were not one of the, the big 10. Of course. Right. And I think, I think it was those 10. And then like 75%. Oh, yeah. All the districts had work to do. You know, but the, those were where most of the agricultural production was yeah. happening. And I, I like to think that uh, Daryl and James passed down these large, ambitious numbers in the whip. Uh, I know the agency wide. But for three rivers, they were obviously in the whip for the next given large numbers. And how do these numbers that you're seeing actually achieve compared to the whip goals for three years? I'll go back. I, I have that slide. slide. It's between 80 and 50%, and some of the 50% are, um, there you go. Um, some of the numbers are capped more because of verification. So um, this is where they were getting uh, percentage wise for their district, whereas before it was zero. So they went from zero to fifty-five percent. So you've got ninety-nine point seven percent uh, enrolled, mm -hmm. and then eighty point five percent of lift goals. Yeah. Where's that last twenty percent can come from? And out find twenty percent, but fifty-five percent. Uh, where's that other fifty percent? It is my understanding that what the please, James. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. The percentages you see here is a percent of the available land use in the model on which to apply, which we've already established doesn't necessarily align well with what they actually think they have or know they have uh, in terms of acreage in the area. So there's a disconnect there um, that hopefully will be getting resolved this winter with the new uh, land use data. So, what you see is the, the wind goal for core nitrogen was eight and a half percent of all available crop land. Uh, and, and what they achieved was nine more. So, I that overachieved. I think that's what they Right? In 2020. Uh, so, we're 20, 20, 49 of the 49 of the 59. Okay, we're, we're, we're close. You get a few more people to adopt. Adjusted nitrogen applications, 31 point eight. Obviously, a little room to grow, uh, and you know, ultimately, the same 91.8 percent that have our nutrient management plan theoretically could have the level of practice. Yeah, I, I, but, I was misreading the chart. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so now the, the nitrogen, I mean, the phosphorus timing one. I don't know what to tell you there. Um, obviously, it's not something that they do here because they still are at zero. Uh, so maybe the whip shouldn't have had that. We need to find a way to offset those phosphorus reductions that were expected from that practice with something that's higher rates of core, perhaps. Uh, Another question that, that bringing the producer in and opening up the books and, the, and, and records, you know, is that like we did it once and we got the bulk of the work done and next year it's much shorter check in or does that mean? It's, you know, depending on their rotations for any changes that they make, it's the same thing all over again because uh, where you've had beans, you're going to tend to have corn. Where you had corn, you're going to tend to have beans or you're going to have, you know, a, a wheat. Um, and so, no, it's it's every year you've got to lay out the plans. You picked up fields, you dropped fields. Um, a field was flooded, and you can't do anything with it right now. Um, and so, no, every year it's the same thing. It's a, this is what do you plan on doing? You know, on your operation, um, you know, for the next eighteen months. Just clarify, well, they're all theoretically eligible, like ninety-one point eight percent, as you said. Yeah. 
core plan, you can have a core plan for soybeans, but you're probably not going to have a nitrogen application. So, the idea of a rate reduction or replacement for a timely practice on soybeans is not likely to happen. Right. And, and you have a reason that the core is going to be a core bean or somebody on bean bean. It's a bean bean. We have a nitrogen difference for corn. And that's where the producers like this stacking because most of them are not all beans and they're not all corn. And so they could bring this in and based on you know the, the, the farmer track, generally track, they can say, okay, this year it's going to be corn. They're eligible for certainly much more of the nitrogen application uh, components. Beans, you know, no. Um, but it's it's clear cut and they, they walk out with a sheet of paper where they can see that. Um, and so they can see their operations and they know, okay, if I change this, then I need to call them and, and kind of get that adjusted. And so it's a, it's a lot of a process through the whole year, um, but they, they liked that part of it. They weren't, you know, this sheet's over here is only for my beans, this sheet over here is only for my corn. Uh, they, it was one packet of information that they received and it was just, you know, stepped out and they, they liked that component of it.
Yeah, absolutely. All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started for the sake of time. Um, I did notice in the agenda that I had 15 minutes, and so my presentation is pretty brief, but I understand that there is a mis mistype there. So we'll have plenty of time for questions, um, and we won't drag on with a bunch of slides. Uh, but I'm Jacob Gilley. I'm the Mid-Atlantic Sustainable Grazing Manager for American Farmland Trust. Um, I've held this position for the past three years, and um, it's a project that is privately funded by a family foundation in Rappahannock County. Um, and uh, we have been working with producers in the five county region of Orange, Madison, Culpeper, Rappahannock, and Fall here uh, primarily. And um, we've been working with pilot producers and adopting lots of practices that we can talk about. Um, but we've also been kind of taking what we've learned and spreading it throughout the, the state and the region and also nationally we've done a few um, conferences as well but um, before we dive into the, the presentation we actually just finished up a video um, last month that we've been working on for a while uh, we've had a drone crew project so we've been collecting all the drone footage of the producers that we work with um, and we also hired BPM out of Richmond to come up and do some producer interviews get some testimonials and um, at the end of the video created, they are first class, awesome to work with. Um, it's, it's not super duper cheap, but it's super high quality. And the turnaround time, um, let's see, we had the National Cowboys Youth Association conference that we went to, and they turned around that video in less than a week, um, came up with interviews. And uh, so we're going to go ahead and start with that video because I feel like it gives you a really good picture of, of what we've been doing over the past three years, and then I'll dive into the presentation, give a little bit more detail and substance, and then talk about where we plan to go in the future. Just give me one second, I'll get this all set up. American Farmland Trust launched the conservation agriculture movement in 1980. Together, we protect agricultural land, we promote environmentally sound farming and ranching practices, and we fight to keep farmers and ranchers where they belong, on the land. We are more than policy and land protection. American Farmland Trust works to protect your water, soil, business, and all our futures. So American Farmland Trust has been a great collaborator as they have come in and helped our socially disadvantaged farmers look at good agriculture environmental stewardship, but also just fostering the whole good grass management, pasture management, grazing programs so that farmers can really understand how to keep environmental stewardship. So American Farmland Trust launched the Sustainable Grazing Project back in 2019. The Sustainable Grazing Project pairs scientifically proven regenerative practices um, with outreach uh, and education for producers. And we work with those producers to help improve the soils on their operations and the water quality, um, but overall production as well, which leads to more profitability. Sustainable grazing means supporting the land that supports us and protecting every part of that system, including pollinators, grassland birds, and wildlife. It takes all the pieces, including us, working together for land to thrive. Another practice that, that Farmland Trust and the Sustainable Grazing Project promote would be rotational grazing, meaning instead of just opening all the gates and letting the cattle have the whole farm, we break it into small paddocks and rotate the cattle so that once they graze a pasture, they don't come back into that pasture for at least 75 days. And that promotes grass growth. It breaks up the parasite cycle, the fly and the larvae cycle. It gives the land a chance to heal. Um, the ground is essentially insulated from the heat of the sun, so it doesn't dry and crack and break open the way it would if you made hay or, or crops on it. So through the Sustainable Grazing Project, we've helped producers, especially through the pandemic, improve their markets through helping them develop online stores, social media. We've developed uh, footage and promotional material for them. It's just given me a different perspective on uh, how things can be different. Uh, trying to bring in a little technology into our businesses. We use uh, 
pasture rotation apps, you know, that help with uh, tracking uh, all of our pastures, when we put nutrients on them, when we've had cows on them, how long they were grazed, how long of rest they've had since the last time you had cows on it. And through this um, relationship we've had and formed with producers, we also participate and support each link in the chain once the food leaves the farm. We support food banks, farm stores, farmers markets, butcher shops, and restaurants. Is AFT a good partner? AFT is a, a great partner. And there's lots of groups out there that claim to help the farmer. Um, but after working with Jacob in the Sustainable Grazing Project through American Farmland Trust, uh, they're genuinely here to help the farmer and, and save farmland. They're here trying to help us, you know. If you have somebody that is, their agenda that they're pushing is only that they want you to be more successful. And what's, how's that wrong? American farmland sustains us all. It is the foundation of our economy. It is the soul of our country. It is what we leave our children. The future depends on our farmers, ranchers, and agricultural land. No farms, no food, no future. Producers that we work with do an excellent job, and and I think it's always important. Uh, I think sometimes livestock get a bad rap when it comes to conservation, um, but just like anything, you you have some bad apples that kind of give a negative um, negative outlook for an entire industry. When uh, actuality, there's a lot of great producers in Virginia and beyond, and um, so we're going to talk about some of those great producers. And like I said, we're in Madison, right hand culture up here at Arms at this time. Project started in 2018, 19, um, and we just found out that the, the project is funded for another three years. So we're gonna move into uh, the next phase, but you can go to the next slide. So when when I first found this position, prior to this, I worked for Call Harbor Co-op as a field sales rep doing soil sampling, management recommendations, um, selling feed fertilizer, fencing materials. So I, I had a really good idea of what producers needed my wife and I also have a cattle operation in Madison, Orange County. We rent land, cow calf, we background calves. And so I, I, I really enjoy this position because I can walk the line of conservation and producers and kind of get a good feel. And so when, when I saw this job posted at two o'clock in the morning, when, one morning or night, um, it was talking about helping producers uh, accomplish conservation. Well, we work closely with the Public Soil Water NRCS on our operation doing stream exclusion. And so I was like, well, I can help producers do that. Uh, I talked about direct marketing is actually more value for the, the livestock that we produce. And my wife and I, we direct market. So yeah, I can probably help with that. And so it's been a, a really fun project because it's brand new for AFT. Uh, we've got offices all across the country. Um, I work at the Mid Atlantic, where it's just me and my boss, Jamie Graw, up in, um, in DC. Um, and they said it's going to be a holistic project. And I said, okay, great, holistic. Um, that's another word for shotgun approach to doing a whole lot of stuff. Um, but it's fun because it's important. If you only focus on one component, there's a lot of pieces that are getting missed. Um, but it took me a while to understand that taking a holistic approach is slower. Um, you don't feel like you always make as much progress, but you're moving a lot of pieces at one time, like a small army. And so those pieces, um, we focused on enhanced conservation. Um, the economics of sustainable grazing. So if producers aren't profitable, uh, they're not going to be in it for long haul. It's not sustainable. Um, so that's a focus of our project um, as well as conservation. Improved production. Um, we don't want producers to give up in order to gain conservation. And so we're doing some work with Piedmont Grassland Bird Initiative just in the back. And, you know, we're looking at delayed mowing, um, for instance, for grassland bird conservation. Well, in doing that, you lose some quality and some hay. But you're thinking of conservation. And so we're working with them to do research and deal with the landscape to say, well, how do we quantify this decrease in quality and how can we compensate producers to offset that? So those are some of the things that we're looking at. Um, we also look at land access and protection. 
And land access is, is a big challenge because, you know, obviously they're not making any more land and the development is continuing to, to come about. Um, we need to preserve what we have. Uh, we also need to help the, the next generation or new generation of producers access that land. Um, and perennial pastures can be pretty challenging to find or landowners that folks are leasing from can be difficult to work with at times, especially when we're adopting infrastructure and conservation practices. Um, we work in local food systems like food banks, and uh, we've been um, providing producers funding to um, be able to sell the products to food banks. Uh, we've also looked at uh, local processing systems and bottlenecks, especially during the pandemic, um, where store shelves were empty. So that is a, a way that we're looking um, at trying to improve conservation in addition to land use planning and policy. Um, next slide. So again, when we started this project, I had some producers that I already knew in the region, uh, and we had seven producers to get started. And um, over the past couple of years, we've added several more. And so now we currently have 12 pilot producers that we're working very closely with in the region. We have a few others that we assist with, but they're not official pilot producers. Um, and you can see the breakdown of kind of where they're located uh, within the region. Next slide. And so some of the new producers that we picked up, um, we've highlighted here. I found out that uh, I didn't have as much diversity within the producers as I probably needed in order to get some really good perspective. And so we added a couple of women um, landowners and producers uh, over the past year and a half. Um, also added some uh, new and beginning producers where they're first generation. So for instance, um, uh, AFT has a women from land program that we've been doing for years, working with women landowners and producers. Camilla um, up in Culpepper, um, she actually participated in our women from land program, found out about us. Um, and so she came on board along with Andrea Young, also participated in that program. Um, I was talking to JB Daniel at NRCS, uh, USCA. And I also still have Virginia Ford's Grass on Council Board, and they've got a grant where they're doing a mentoring program. And um, I said, JB, it might be weird because we kind of already have our own mentoring program, but would you mind if I become a mentor for BFGC so that we can parallel our projects and, and be able to overlap and see where we're doing some cool things, where you all are doing cool things, and say, yeah, that's great. And so um, for that, I'm actually mentoring Camilla and Rick. Um, Rick actually did reference to through JB. Um, and he's in Orange County and just bought a piece of property that's being paid and he wants to do regenerative grazing on it. So it's kind of a, a clean slate, a lot of fun. Uh, Will Van Hill sees that originally from Northern Virginia, um, brand new to the industry, always looking to learn, does a lot of solar powered watering systems and solar powered fencing, um, rides a bike, bicycle around the chip cows, like very uh, regenerative focused. And then Danny Franklin, he's still at Virginia Tech, but uh, he's coming back to the family farm. But they've been leasing the farm to another producer, a bigger cattle corporation, and he wants to kind of get into it himself. So uh, that's kind of the, the newer producers for us. Um, our producers range anywhere from probably 10 cows up to 300 cows. And land based, <laughs> some folks are owned 100% of their land, some rent 100%. Uh, some of it's under conservation easement, some of it's not. And so we try to get a good diversity within the producers and the type of land that we're working on. Next. So um, I went to a ranching for profit workshop, uh, or actually, it's a ranching for profit school in Oklahoma City back in May. And this five day school was awesome, took one of our pilot producers. And it's put on by ranch management consultants. And a lot of people say, well, what's a ranch have to do with Virginia? That's a Western thing. But a lot of the concepts that they teach are, are very similar to what we're focused on. And learned a lot in that school, but the number one takeaway that I came home with was we're not leveraging the network that we have near to where we should. We did exercises there around a the round table. And you know, we all answer a questionnaire by ourselves, then we sit down and talk about it, and we end up seeing a percentage increase by working together. And I was like, well, that's common sense. Yet we weren't meeting quarterly with our pilot producers and touring each other's operations. So as soon as I got home, we set three dates. Um, we've got meetings quarterly scheduled, 
And this was the first one that we did at the uh, Coda Ranch in Culpeper. They were great goats. Um, we had local beef from their operation. He did a sheep dog trial for us. We toured, you know, everything. And people could ask questions. We could work with each other. So that was really neat. Um, we've got one coming up September 22nd. At Lev Locus Hill County, where we've got a summer annual plot planted. So we're going to go out there and about different uh, forage shoots. Uh, and he also does wildlife management and some uh, managed hunts. So that will be interesting. Then we're going to change the market in December where we're going to learn how they're going to full season grass stand. Um, they really participate in some grass and bird research. And they also have a market garden along with their livestock. So we're really excited about that component. <laughs> Next slide. And of course, there are regenerative role models, and it can be a little bit confusing about what is sustainable, what is regenerative. There's several definitions to look at, but you know, sustainable is kind of maintaining um, versus regenerating, you're building up. And so we kind of use both the terms. Um, and honestly, the conversation I had in my head when we started to name the project was it used to be the rec clinic project. And I said, well, that doesn't really tell anybody much about it. And I said, if we go regenerative, then I know there's a certain percent of producers that are going to say, well, that's just, that's a crazy stuff way out in left field. I said, if we go with sustainable, there's a chance that I can pick up some of those more, uh, I guess, set in their ways types of producers. And so honestly, that was kind of the disturbing factor there. Um, but we do believe in regenerating the soils um, and regenerating operations and, and sustaining that next generation to come. And so these role models, you know, they, um, held meetings at their operation. We've done demonstrations and workshops. Last year, we did a summer annual field day uh, forage workshop where we had 52 producers come out and two of the different uh, forages that we planted looked at alternative shade methods and watering methods. And I was really happy with how that turned out. Um, I'm really just proud of the producers that we're working with. They, they've done a great job. Uh, next slide. So again, <clears throat> taking a holistic approach, we're looking at several things, not just water quality, but that is uh, one that we focused on quite a bit with stream exclusion. We work hand in hand with the soil water conservation districts and, uh, and the water Fairfax of Culpepper. Um, and also, wait, is it Lord Fairfax? No, John Marshall. John Marshall. Yeah, sorry, I knew it was wrong. John Marshall and Culpepper Soil Water, along with NRCS. And, um, you know, for instance, this drone shop was taking it with the Institute outside of uh, Warrington, and it was fun. I got to sit down with Bert up there and help him design, you know, you should put your fences here, you should angle them back to the barns to make a central location if you need to load cattle up, but not just looking at, oh, we're fencing out water, but how is this going to help you manage the livestock there there? Because from what I've seen, we don't sell that side of it as well as we should. We don't say, hey, you're improving water quality is kind of like the first thing that we, we sell them on versus being a producer myself. The first thing I sold myself on was like, hey, it's way easier to get your cattle up and it's way easier to, if a cow is calving, that calf doesn't slide down into the mud and that calf doesn't slide down into the sleet and snow. So those are the things that you can sell on. And then like, by the way, you're also improving water quality. Um, and so we've done that. We've done soil sampling, nutrient management plans, grazing management plans. We're really promoting native warm season grasses, not only for the grassland birds, but also their improved weight gain. I mean, you can get two pounds of average daily gain on cattle and natives versus fescue in the summer, you're happy if they don't lose weight. So uh, we put up kestrel boxes, uh, we've worked with buffers, so uh, cross seeding clover. And uh, as the video mentioned, we've been using a couple of different apps. Um, I feel like that's a a way to improve our record keeping. It's a way to improve um, just being aware of what's going on in our operation if we're recording it and taking pictures. But also it's a way to get the next generation interested about the operation. Uh, we had a workshop where I could tell the middle school age kid, he wasn't really paying attention to anything until we were like, oh, and this app does this. And I said, what? And so he came up and started working on the phone and all of a sudden his dad said, well, I had no idea he was even interested at all in our operation. But it's just finding ways to engage that generation. Um, when it comes to soil, uh, Grassroots Carbon is a company that uh, has recently been developed. We've been using Pasture Map, which is a grazing app, but they actually have an affiliate company called Grassroots Carbon where you can actually get paid for your carbon credits. 
um, and sequestering carbon. So um, I'm excited to see where that's going. You know, right now they're working in the Northern Great Plains and in Texas, um, but they said that if they do come to the East Coast, you know, they're gonna keep us in mind because we already have lots of producers using these practices, using their app. And so that's a way of getting additional value for producers. Next slide. So the next generation, we actually hosted a, a collegiate grazing school at Virginia Tech. Um, we partnered with the two-year Ag Tech program down there on that, in addition to Virginia Forge and Grassland Council. And I think we had maybe around 20, 30 students uh, come to that. And we talked about apps and software. We talked about temporary infrastructure. You know, of course, with Virginia, we can now exclude livestock from streams using temporary fencing. And so teaching that next generation of how to use these tools is extremely important. <clears throat> next slide. So um, another area that we focused in, and I'm pretty excited about it, it's worked out better than I could have anticipated. We've actually been <laughs> renting out uh, equipment um, for very cheap prices to producers to reduce some of those barriers to entry. And uh, our first purchase was a portable corral system that if you're renting land, you don't want to invest a lot of time and money into building corrals, then you can just come to us and say, hey, I want to use that corral for $35. They can take it out there and hold it in less than 15 minutes, gather up unruly bulls, or they can break check cows, vaccinate them. Um, and I also had in the back of my mind that I will eventually get into grazing cover crops and doing that type of research. And so for grazing cover crops, you need a boundary fence, you need water and a way to get them up. And so we've got one of those covered with this portable corral. And it's been getting used quite a bit. Um, and we also have a poultry processing trailer. So for I realized that a lot of the producers we were working with were still on the larger scale. And so to hit some of those small scale producers with just a couple acres, uh, we spent $3,500 on a portable poultry processing trailer. And it's been getting rented out like every other week. Um, and my wife and I have used it and do 50 birds in a few hours. It's really not bad. And for people wanting to get into direct marketing, um, you don't have to take chickens to a USDA inspected facility and do it to a thousand on your farm. And so it just gets their appetite wet to where they can continue to supply the local food system with a regeneratively raised product. <clears throat> and uh, it took me a while, but I found a website called Goopable, um, which is easy to use. It's an annual subscription. You can log on and see uh, availability dates for the equipment. You can check it out. You can pay for it and sign the waiver form. Uh, and it works quite well. And that money just comes into AFT through Stripe. And then we use that to pay for the subscription and maintenance on the equipment. <clears throat> Next slide. So I'm really excited about this component because um, it takes a lot of time to fill out all the paperwork to do conservation. It takes money. It's stressful on marriages. I can definitely, <laughs> definitely say that. And, you know, we put in a winter feeding barn, and my wife's like, "We don't need this. We don't need this." It's like, believe me, it'll work. It'll it'll pay off. Um, Put in a ton of stream exclusion fencing, rotational, four watering controls, native warm seasons, four hard crossing. So we, we went through it. It's extremely stressful, but it, at the end of the day, it's worth it. But I want producers to get paid for it in other ways. And so um, we've been working with a partner up in Rap Mechanic, and she's been diving into a, a lot of the certifications that are available. And whether that's animal welfare approved, grass fed, regenerative certified, whether it's all the bonds, bird friendly, you name it, there's a certification out there. And so we've dived into most of the ones that we can find. We've built out a huge Excel spreadsheet. And now we need to go back into that information and say, all right, which one is the best thing for the buck for producers? What's the best thing for the buck for the consumer? And then how much are people willing to pay? And so that's our next step is contacting UVA, William and Mary JMU, the institutional buyers that are, are looking for those sustainability goals and willing to pay maybe a little bit extra. Um, so we're excited about that. And through Fema Crest and Bird Initiative, I can see down the road that we might develop our own uh, certification. Next slide. Five minutes. Cool. So there's no way that we could do any of what we do without great partners. And that's been from day one. Uh, Piedmont Environmental Council has kind of taken us in and introduced us to a lot of folks. Even though I'm from Madison, Orange area, there's still a lot of folks within the conservation community that I wasn't aware of. And, and so working with them and Saltwater and NRCS, 
um, work closely with Chesapeake Bay Foundation, Friends of the Red Panic, uh, Virginia Working Landscapes, Virginia Forest Grassland Council. Um, really, you know, couldn't do it without those folks and have enjoyed the friendships that I've built through that process um, and getting to learn, you know, before engaging in this project, I didn't know much about grassland birds. And now I have an appreciation for them. I'm changing my management on our operation for them, but I'm also seeing the benefits in other ways. So it's been really interesting. Next slide. Uh, we've also engaged um, within the industry. So we have a membership to the U.S. Round Table for Sustainable Beef. <clears throat> We're part of the Mountain Bay Grazing Alliance. I uh, and chair of the subcommittee for technology and education on that. And then we've provided sponsorship. We uh, help support Virginia Ag and Classroom through Farm Bureau, uh, help pay for uh, development of some virtual tours uh, for students back uh, during the heart of the pandemic. They couldn't get out on farms and were a member of the Virginia Ag Business Council. Next slide. So in expanding our impact, you know, as I mentioned, we got funding for another three years, thank goodness. Otherwise, I might have been looking for a job. Um, but with this next step, we want to continue kind of what we've been doing. We probably don't want to add a ton of extra pilot producers because we still feel like that core group of producers we have have untapped, you know, needs and opportunities. But we do want to uh, focus on this cover crop grazing concept. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity around it. We actually applied for an NRCS SIG grant. Um, unfortunately, we weren't funded, but I think we can move forward um, through other sources. But I feel like we've kind of hit a ceiling on cover crops. And this is my opinion. There's no data that, that kind of backs it up, but you know, it's just kind of common sense when you think about a crop producer that's got thousands of dollars sitting out in the field in the fall, you know, what would you do? Would you go and harvest it and then plant cover crop and then harvest another field, plant cover crop, harvest another field. No, you're gonna go harvest it, put in the grain bin or put it on a truck and send it to market, get paid, and then you're gonna put in a cover crop. At least that's the way I would see it. But I envision a concept where we can um, work with livestock producers, we work with crop producers, we can marry them together, we can come up with solid sublease type agreements. Um, I think we can work through VDAX's Virginia Farm Link program to kind of help make it work. Uh, we're hired on um, uh, legal con consultation uh, to help develop a solid lease, understand legal fence requirements around boundaries and fields, what's the most cost effective fence, watering. We're going to go through a whole gamut. Um, and we're planning a cover crop plot this fall in Rappahannock County with nine different mixes. It's just a demonstration to get people interested. Um, but starting next year, we're going to identify um, a couple of different livestock producers, a couple of different crop producers and go through and show how this can work. Um, and hopefully my goal would be to figure out what can the livestock producer pay? What do they need to get the cover crop planted themselves? And um, what benefits are there to the crop producer? And we're gonna hopefully showcase that you're not gonna have a bunch of traction issues or any other challenges, but we've got ways of measuring that moving forward. So we're excited about it. Um, and again, focusing on other producers, um, whether that's BIPOC community, women, um, small producers, and continuing to work around local food systems, um, which is extremely vital for the community. Next slide. So I think we used up the time even though I anticipated. Yeah. <laughs> so this picture is actually from the um, summer annual plot that we did back in September of last year. And you see we had cars lined all the way up the road, which was fun. And then we had um, some snacks and stuff, and we had our crowd out there. And we were able to walk and talk about the different um, different forages that we planted. We planted a sorghum Sudan, two types of Sudan grass, we planted pearl millet, and buckwheat mixed with some crab grass. And we compared the actual gains of the cattle grazing here and then the stocking rate we could run versus this was perennial fescue based pasture. And we used portable shade, you can kind of see some of the spots where we didn't move it every day. We would start to get some bare spots. Um, and then we compared it actually against this that and used temporary poly wire to split it and um, used water. So we actually had to do a pressurized rear ground water system that ran portable water up and down the fence line. And that was fun to showcase too. Um, just kind of got producers to understand you can get by with very little infrastructure. Uh, and, and do a good job of protection for reasons. 
Yes, so that's on the student team. I'm going to set this part on the schedule and that session will be expected to be covered. So we've got 15 minutes of raising new questions for Jacob. We're going to start setting up. If you guys want to chat, you are welcome to stay. Okay. 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 Okay.
Well, hello, and thank you all so much for attending our presentation today. Um, we spent our entire summer um, kind of researching bioretention systems throughout the counties of Stafford in Spotsylvania. And we were mostly interested in sort of seeing how they were doing after most of them, most of them having been in place for about 20 or more years now. Uh, we really wanted to see if you know they were still working efficiently, how they were doing, um, and just if we could sort of come up with any solutions that might even improve the performance that they currently have now. So we'll start with a few introductions. Um, my name is Pam Daniels. I'm an environmental science major at the University of Mary Washington. Um, I'm Catherine Wolf. I'm an environmental and GIS major at the University of Mary Washington. Um, we did have one other partner on our research team. Unfortunately, she couldn't be here today just because she had scheduling conflicts with her classes. But uh, this lovely face right here is Claire Bradley. And, you know, you can just kind of stare at your picture and think about what could have been. <laughs> but so you know me and Kat, and then we also have our faculty advisor, Professor John Tibet. So we spent our summer doing the research um, at the University of Mary Washington, specifically in the Jefferson Science Center. Uh, working under the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. You can see Kat and I working through some GIS analysis up here in the corner, as well as Kat and Claire going over some of the many soil samples that we took while we were doing some of our field measurements and research. So to give you an idea of what we're going to be going through today, we created a little bit of a roadmap. Um, we're going to start off with some background information just on bioretention systems and why we like them so much followed by our methodology and sort of the little steps that we took to do our research in the first place, our findings and results that came out of the analysis we did, um, a case study that we were able to perform using some of the data we collected at our sites, the recommendations and suggestions that we generated on how we could improve the function of these sites and overall efficiency, and then a question and answer session for those who have any questions they'd like to ask. So to start with background, why is it that we like fire protection systems in the first place? A few words, they're super effective and they're very great. Um, in terms of effectiveness, they're incredibly useful for removing excess phosphorus and nitrogen from runoff that is coming from uh, parking lots or roads or sidewalks, as well as any other toxic pollutants that is in our water. Um, as you can see down here, we have this image. Well, you can't really see it because of the lighting, but this is the Chesapeake Bay with a very large algal bloom, um, which is one of the things that's caused by excess loads of nitrogen and phosphorus, hence the usefulness of systems like these. Therefore, they're super important for sort of achieving our goals with the Chesapeake Bay to little maximum daily load, just because they're able to remove those uh, extra pollutants and overall make the bay a healthier place. However, many of these practices are now reaching 20 or more years old, and as many things often do with age, they can sometimes degrade. So we're seeing a lot of, or we expected to see quite a few issues in terms of performance, either because of faulty initial designs that happened at the construction stage, or simply because there was poor maintenance and they weren't being kept up with over time. Just to sort of drive the point home about their importance to the bay, we've included this image from the Rappahannock River Watch for COFOR. Uh, the dissolved oxygen in the Rappahannock River monthly in 2014, with the red over here representing the lowest dissolved oxygen and the kind of bluish colors representing the highest dissolved oxygen. And again, most of that uh, low DO is due to the fact that there's all of this pollution going into the bay and ultimately resulting in this state. In terms of our purposes and obje objectives for the product, or well, project, the first thing that we really wanted to look into were the causes of this underperformance. Why were these things happening? Were there any things in common between the sites? Were there patterns that we could identify in the first place? We also wanted to take that data that we were able to collect and look into those patterns to see if we could model them in a manner that would give us an idea of the magnitude of these issues and the problems that they were causing. And then finally, and arguably one of the most important components of the study was to come up with recommendations and suggestions that could improve the function of these sites in terms of design and maintenance overall. 
Now I will hand it over to Pat to go over the methodology section. Thank you, Pam. So now I'm going to be going over the methodology of our project to show you the steps that we took to get the results. So first of all, before we go too in depth with our methodology, we need to define some key terms for you today. So there are two types of bioretention systems that we looked at, one of those being online systems, which is this top um, square right here, and offline systems. So the difference being for online systems, when water enters, it has to go through the inlet and flow throughout the whole bed to get to an overflow. Where in offline systems, water flows into the system, and once it reaches its ponding max, water doesn't go into the system and bypasses into a drop inlet. Offline systems are generally more preferred designs as when the water quality volume enters the system, it isn't pushed out into the overflow like with online systems. And instead, the, the water quality volume is set to stay within that system. But overall, so for the sites that we surveyed, we looked at sites that were close in proximity to the University of Mary Washington. In total, we were able to survey 109 sites, 80, 28 of them offline and 81 of them online systems. And also with our, um, where we go? And with our collection, we looked at physical parameters. This was not a chemical analysis of the results of bioretention, but a physical understanding of the design and underperformance of these sites. But so for our field protocol and data collection parameters, we wanted to understand the extent of underperformance. And to understand that, we first of all just had to understand how these sites worked. So we had some set areas of interest that we had established, for instance, understanding uh, the flow of water within these systems, ponding volume. And from those very broad areas of interest, we narrowed it down to set parameters that we knew we could go out to the field and collect using tools from our lab. So for instance, with ponding elevation, we knew that we could, we needed the elevation of inlets, elevation throughout the bed. And so using a survey leveler, Claire is using right here, we went out and shot elevations. And this is just one example of how we were able to get the parameters that we wanted to look at within these sites. And then every time we went out into the field using survey one, two, three, which is an ARC program that we access mobily, there were, we made a set survey of different uh, data types depending on what we were looking at. And then from there, we were able to create a database in ArcGIS. And then collectively, all of our data was put into Excel where we organized it based on certain sets of information that we were looking for, um, which we uh, put together to give you the information you're going to present. And I skipped a couple of slides. Earlier, <laughs> okay, so now we come to our findings for the study overall. To start, we want to sort of summarize the data a little bit. Um, up here, we have a visualization of our functional ratings for those sites. So every time we went out to a site and survey one to three, we would give the site a rating from one to 10, with one being the lowest functionality and 10 being the highest functionality. And as you can kind of see up here in this graph up top, most of them fell in this sort of moderately functioning area, meaning that a lot of these sites were not functioning anywhere near their fullest potential. We also, uh, there we go. Um, we also analyzed these sites in terms of whether or not they were compliant with DEQ specifications. Um, they graphed them based on the frequency of those specifications that were not met. So the most common ones that we found were the lack of pretreatment and the actual ponding depth. And the ponding depth is directly related to the actual level of functionality within the system. However, one caveat with the pretreatment is that many of the sites we visited were not or were built before the current regulations that we have now. So we believe that might also play some sort of role in why it was such something that we saw so frequently within the sites. <clears throat> to start, we were analyzing size of erosion as one of our parameters. And overall, we found that 25% of the sites that we visited had some sort of size of erosion to varying degrees of severity. However, we were also interested, based off of some of the literature that we read, in 
how much a, a higher incline in terms of the slope would actually impact the sites. Um, and some of the literature that we were reading was stating that, you know, 20% incline actually is the highest you should go and you shouldn't go any higher than that. So we set 25% incline as sort of like our threshold. And we found that 72% of the eroding slopes from this category up here actually had inclines of greater than 25%. The next issue that we looked at was short circuiting. Short circuiting is specifically most important in online systems just because you have all of that water being forced into the system no matter what. There's nothing to divert the flow to a drop inlet. It all has to go in. And if it's going to get into the sewage system, it's going to go through this, which is already located inside the system. And short circuiting takes place when you have that overflow inside the system placed directly in front of the inlet so that when water comes in through these, they just kind of drop straight to the sewage system and nothing actually gets treated. Um, and although there were only 11% of the online sites that we visited that had a short circuiting issue, because of the fact that you completely diminish the functionality of the system by not treating the water in the first place, we felt it was still very important to include this perimeter in here because of how much it actually impacts the function of the system. We also analyzed bare soil in terms of surface crust and mulch. Um, surface crust makes it very difficult for water to penetrate through the soil because of the impermeability factor that it has. If you have more compact soil on the top, obviously water can't filter through and ultimately be treated by the system itself. And we found that 18% of the systems that we visited had some form of surface crust. We were also interested in mulch. The DEQ specifies that these systems need to have at least two inches of mulch, mulch present in them. Um, because of the fact that mulch is super important for binding heavy toxic metals to them that would ultimately end up in the water base. And we found that 78% of the systems that we visited had less than two inch, inches of mulch present in them, meaning that you might have had some sort of toxic metals that were entering the water. We also analyzed pretreatment. Again, with that caveat that many of these sites were built at a time where we didn't have the current regulation for pretreatment that we have now. Um, but we found that 74% of these sites were lacking pretreatment, which is typically important for removing other debris um, from waterways like sediments and whatnot. We were also interested in media compaction. Uh, and we found that 46% of the sites we visited had greater than, or compaction levels greater than 300 uh, PSI. We selected PS, or 300 PSI as a threshold because based off of some of the literature that we were doing when we were going through our study, um, we saw some claims that 300 PSI tends to be a threshold for what roots can penetrate in the ground in terms of how much they can grow. And if, if you have anything higher than that, it could inhibit their growth. So we decided that this would be a good threshold since plants are a very central component of the systems in the first place. Um, and as you can see by these pictures over here, this is an image of a sediment core that we took while we were on a site with all of this clay relatively shallow in the bed. And then we also have this sediment sample over here, which is essentially just a wine core. So with ponding, since it has such an important impact on the system in terms of functionality, we felt like we should really try to make this stand out. Um, in a normal bed, you would have it completely flat. It would be level and you'd achieve all of the volume that you initially hoped to when you were planning the site in the first place. But oftentimes, whether it's due to faulty initial design or just settling over time, the bed can tilt so that you have all of the water ending up on one side of it and you're not making use of the entire volume. And based on this graphic up here, you can actually see that you're reducing the ponding volume because you're tilting it. And all of this water is going to want to go to this side, and you're losing all of this space. And you ultimately aren't getting the water treatment that you were initially hoping for when the site was put in place. And based off of our research and the data we collected, we found that 40% of the sites that we visited were below the minimum required ponding based off of the codes put forth by the DEQ. Was that based on 2015 or after 2015 on the elevations? Did, did you qualify? Because, sorry, can I ask a question? Oh, of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, you speak about how some of the biotechnology measures may have been 
if I said pre 2015, I think that's when the regulations changed. We're from an average of what all the money to lose. And they also, I think, changed some of the hardware from six inches to the road. It could be a TQ or close to all the 12 inches or something like that. And so when you were looking, when you evaluating the funding elevations based on either one criteria or just absent, there wasn't a funding or a funding. Um, when we were evaluating it, we based it off of the criteria, like, is it at least six inches, is it six to 12? We actually created like a little, or a certificate, created like a little flow chart for us to follow out in the field that kind of was like, okay, if it has this media depth, if it has this amount of, or this diversity of plants, it's going to be this class of fire retention. And so we actually used <clears throat> ponding as a way to kind of like class the fire retentions from micro level one, micro level two, fire retention level one, fire retention level two. But we actually calculated the ponding by doing um, bed elevations as well as an elevation at the, uh, the overflow in the center. I think. Um, and so the next component we were interested in was in the blockages. Now, in the blockages are really only super important for offline systems because of that fact that there can be flow diverted from the inlet into the overport, the drop inlet. Um, and as you can see here, this is an image of, that we found of inlet debris. And then we also have this image over here, which still has inlet debris, but rather than sticks and leaves and garbage, it's grit that was from the water that was cooling there. And this is incredibly important because the fact you can't really see it as the glare, but in this image, there's riprap that has been piled up. So rather than a, like a drop in elevation, there's actually a gain in elevation which further exacerbates the issue because you have water pooling in that area. And when it pools, it's gonna drop the grit that it's carrying and creating a burn, which will ultimately just make the problem more, uh, would make it worse. <clears throat> and in the offline systems that we visited, about half of them had some form of inlet blockage out of the 109 sites that we had. Okay. So now I'm gonna hand it back over to Kat to go over a case study. Thank you. So as Pam just mentioned, we saw that 50% of offline systems had blockage within the inlet. So we were kind of looking at these sites and wondering, what is the impact of inlet debris burns on fire retention treatment? In other words, depending on the height of that burn, how much water is bypassing these systems? How much water isn't able to enter these offline systems at all. So what we decided to do was our own case study looking at the height of these burns. So we started by picking a site that we had previously visited, an offline system, that we had seen a amount of debris within the inlet that was blocking the flow of water within the system. And from that site, we went out and, sh and took uh, elevation shots throughout the parking lot to basically create vector point data of a grid that we put into ArcGIS. And from those vector points, we created a DEM model. And from the DEM model, uh, we were able to create a map for subcatchment delineation in ArcGIS. And then from those subcatchment delineations, so they were put into a hydrology hydraulics program called PC Swim. And then in PC Swim, we basically created a like a hypothetical system for the area where we put in values for flow resistance and define uh, the gutter flow. So we could have that channelized flow and the, and the sheet flow from the lot and also sheet flow when it hit that gutter and turned into channelized flow. So from our defined system, we ran different hypothetical storms that had different differences in variation and intensity over time. The main two times that we looked at were a six hour and a 24 hour storm. And from these different hydrographs, we were able to make a flow bypass chart. So I know it's kind of blurry to look at, but down here on the X axis are different time intervals. And on the Y is a certain amount of water entering the system. So for this example, we wanted to look at an inch tall burn. 
So we knew that if this is the height of the berm at one inch, anything below that wouldn't be able to enter these systems. So that's everything in the orange. All of that orange is technically water that is below or equal to the height of the berm that is bypassing. And then taking this a step further, we look at it compared to the water quality volume. So as we know, the water quality volume is that first half inch, that first initial flush of a storm that contains that phosphates and, nit and nitrates and heavy metals that these sites are supposed to be filtering out. But if you look here, this whole section is the portion of the water quality volume that is being completely diverted into the drop inlet. So from these slow bypass graphs, we created bar graphs, uh, percentages of each one, depending on the height of the berm. So in conclusion, from a five, from a 0.5 inch berm, we were looking at almost 13 to 55% of the water quality volume is bypassing the system, which is very significant because for such a small amount of debris in the inlet, we are missing such a crucial part of the water quality volume and the volume of water in total that we are trying to treat. Taking that a step further, an inch degree blockage within an inlet, we're looking at 45 to 99% of the water quality volume is going right past these systems and we're and going straight into sewage water and out into the Chesapeake Bay and not solving the problem that we're trying to with these locations. And another thing that's quite uh, scary is that most of the debris blockages that we saw were actually three inches tall. So if you're thinking about only half an inch and an inch, what would a three inch burn do? So from that, I'm turning it back over to Plan Cam, where we're going to go over our findings and our case studies and the recommendations that we came together for Okay. So to kick things off with our recommendations, the first parameter we really, really wanted to emphasize were our recommendations for ponding depth, since again, this is one of the most important factors in terms of functionality for the systems. And overall, we suggested just ensuring that the ponding depths for these systems um, was actually adequate across the entire bed surface. And to do this, we suggest taking bed elevations both at the actual construction stage and then during inspections as they come along. Because from what I believe we understand at the moment, I think only visual inspections are required rather than actually going out and taking bed readings to see if this system is kind of sloping or not. It's really hard to do that visually. Um, we've tried to do it out in the field so we can kind of like speak truly to that. Um, but overall, strongly sloped beds do tend to reduce the bonding volume because instead of this, you have this, and everything is pulling at one end rather than equally across the board. So we overall just suggested that these inspections should start to incorporate actual bed surface elevations um, in order to ensure that there isn't a sloping bed rather than simply inspecting them visually, just to be sure that everything is a little bit more accurate. Next up, we were interested in suggesting recommendations for how to improve the efficiency of the side slopes and overall just making sure that they aren't negatively impacting the system. With side slopes, when you have that water that's eroding them, you're actually depositing sediment inside the bed that can ultimately create some sort of impermeable layer, which will further kind of reduce the functionality of the system since that water isn't able to filter through as easily. So in order to improve that issue, we suggest actually requiring some sort of stabilization for side slopes that are greater than 25%. And this can be done either by sodding or armoring the side slopes um, with riprap or something just to kind of keep the soil in place so it doesn't end up in the bed. Uh, we also suggest some incorporating some sort of topsoil with them as well, because oftentimes these side slopes, when they're first sort of implemented, it's just a bunch of kind of nutrient poor soil that was brought up during the construction stage and grass isn't going to want to grow on that as much because it doesn't have the nutrients it needs to grow in the first place, which is where topsoil comes in to sort of improve that. The next issue was with elevation drop at the inlet. Again, this is particularly important for offline systems just because if you have an online system, that water will eventually make its way in. It's just going to have to bubble up a little bit before it gets in there. But with offline systems, since you have that drop inlet where things can be diverted, 
we suggest ensuring that these systems have an adequate elevation drop in them so that water is more invited to actually go into it. Um, and to do this, we suggest ensuring that there is at least a three inch elevation drop between the pavement to the top of the riprap in the actual system. Because as we see this one, if you can see it, um, you have the riprap that's actually been built up to a point where there is no elevation loss, there's actually an elevation gain where water is going to pool, drop grit, and just make things worse. So ensuring that you have that three inch elevation drop between the pavement and the top of the riprap is going to be incredibly important for these in order to prevent flow bypass for these systems. We were also generating recommendations for inlet debris. And in this sense, it's as simple as making sure that things are cleared out during inspections, ensuring that you don't have debris in the inlet that would ultimately lead to some sort of blockage. Um, since it does, as we saw in the case study, cause this very significant bypass of the water quality volume, which is what we're trying to treat in the first place. So overall, just it, it requiring some sort of cleaning or inlet inspection during these inspections that come up in systems. So our next recommendation has to do with mulch depth. As Pam had mentioned previously in our findings, we saw that approximately around 70% of sites had less than the adequate two inches of mulch. Some even didn't just have completely bare soil. And as we talked about, mulch is very important for the removal of heavy metals from the water. So one thing that we could that we ensure is just the um, just ensuring significant mulch depth. Um, just during inspect inspections and overall maintenance, going back to these sites and looking at them to make sure that mulch is on these sites as it has been um, shown to be an important part of the uh, cleaning process of, of the stormwater. Um, and also it helps aesthetically, it makes the sites look beautiful um, overall. So our next recommendation has to do with short circuiting. Though there was such a small percentage of sites that short circuited, it renders most of these practices not completely non-functional because water is going straight from the inlet into the overflow and not able to flow into the bed at all. So what we recommend is retrofitting these sites to go back and prevent short circuiting. So either making, going back, and removing these deposit sediments that created kind of a bridge into the overflow like with this site right here and just removing them um, if, if area is an issue that you can actually do a pre-treatment cells which diverts the water into a cell that lets it flow into the rest of the bed and then is diverted later on once ponding uh, max is reached into the overflow so there are a bunch of different ways that you can go about this issue our next recommendation has to do with surface crust. Um, as mentioned previously, surface crust uh, reduces the permeability of water within these systems. Um, so what we recommend is just during inspections, again, maintenance is going back and either removing these sediments or just breaking and breaking them apart to allow for water to percolate down into the media that is below. And lastly, um, has to do with pretreatment. As also mentioned, a lot of these sites were built before the recommendation of pretreatment and were grandfathered in. So we recommend uh, going back and providing pretreatment retrofits to a lot of these older sites uh, that have not that do not have the pretreatment that do not pretreatment currently. This can be done by adding riprap, uh, inlet stones, or even newer technology like uh, stormwater guardians or fox trails that utilize space and breaking apart and getting rid of like trash, excess sediments and sticks from the water before going into the site. Yes. Oh, one minute. Oh, let me show you. Okay, so so these are this is just a summary of our recommendations and the different applications of each one. So design, construction stage, maintenance, and retrofit. But what's important is the uh, stabilization of side slopes uh, in at or adequate elevation drop at inlets and offline systems and prevent short circuiting. The design and construction stage are issues that we can be fixing now. These are issues that if we were to fix currently, that later on we won't, they, it'll 
increase the longevity of these sites and we won't have to deal with uh, their functionality issues now instead of later on. So this is us out in the field. So thank you for listening to us. We really appreciate you guys coming and listening to us today. Here's just some contact and then our QR code to our full report um, and other information. If for any questions. So it is great at three o'clock. So we need to finish it back to yeah, sorry. I'm sure these ladies will be around for a little bit. Do you have any questions about any of the questions Oh, thank you, Anne. <laughs> 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 